This is Ian Williams for VNUNet. I'm here with Saranga Chandratilika, CEO and founder of Blinks. Saranga, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Let's start. Can you tell us a little bit about Blinks, who you are and what you do? Sure, sure. Um, Blinks is a video search engine, which basically means that we run a service at Blinks.com where you can, um, as a user, go along to our site, uh, type in a search for really any topic you want to, and we'll find you videos that match. Um, the key difference is that we don't, we don't actually host the videos ourselves, so we're not sort of a destination. Instead, what we do is we spider in index everybody else's video. So whether it's the BBC site or the CNN site or whatever other site there might be, we'll take you to wherever the best video is. So, um, why do, so this includes going to YouTube and, and the, so the user-generated content sites right. as, as, w as well as the, the commercial uh, provider sites as well? Exactly. It's basically anything and everything from uh, the large professional sites through to the user-generated sites and even things like blogs and personal sites. So um, even if it's quite small, we can find it for you. And online video has uh, had dramatic acceleration in the last couple of years. Some of, some of it's, I think, down to do, to do with the technology. You know, broadband is now fast enough mm -hmm. that we can easily stream video, relatively good content video. But there's also been something of a backlash from the, the provider community about the levels of traffic and, and the strain it puts on their network. What do you guys see from your point of view on that front? Yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, we're not directly affected because obviously search itself isn't um, a heavyweight process. I mean, all we're doing is passing search words backwards and forwards and, and, and results lists, basically, which are very small bits of data. But then, of course, users click on those links and they head off to a site where they go and watch a video. And increasingly, particularly with the professional sites, actually, more than the user-generated sites, you're getting very, very high-quality videos. If you think of things like the BBC's iPlayer or Hulu.com, in the US, they're all um, pumping out sort of full screen streaming content, um, which is certainly a lot more heavyweight than the broadband pipes were originally designed for. So there's, a, there's an issue there where um, the ISPs and the other people who are basically involved in providing you the internet connection um, would like to be able to see part of the revenue that's being generated from that new type of content. Given the costs are so high, they'd like to see some of the uh, income as well. Um, it's a difficult thing to measure. It's a difficult thing to track. Um, I think it has to be fixed long term. Um, one thing, of course, that is changing it is the fact that increasingly the connections are getting yet faster. And as that happens, the strain starts to lessen. Right. OK. So um, the, the infrastructure is being built with this in mind and, and, and developed in, in a way that suggests that people realize we're going to be getting more and more of our content over IP. That's right, yeah. I, it's, it's, you know, it's a never-ending sort of process where I think the technology tends to overshoot where the infrastructure is on the, any given day, and the infrastructure catches up, and then, of course, something extra happens. You know, five, six years ago, um, when dynamic web pages, things like Flash, first came along, um, they were really a bit too heavyweight for the dial-up connections that most people were on at that point, um, and that was a problem. But then, of course, people upgraded to broadband to one megabit and two megabit connections, and, and now people would probably like to have more like a three to five megabit connection, and it's basically a never-ending sort of evolution. Uh, the speed gets better and the applications get better. And, and then, of course, there's the whole offshoot, including on, onto mobile. You know, a lot of people, well, uh, a lot of people are touting mobile um, TV and, and, and streaming of, of mobile video. Yeah. Um, are the, are the, the mobile infrastructures in a better or worse position um, for, for, for that? Um, in, in some ways, a better position, but in some ways, a worse position. So I think that um, mobile is very interesting because uh, if you go to any country where um, people are able to afford to watch a lot of online video on their cell phone, on their mobile device, then what you'll see is that people really, really do. Um, it seems to be a very natural thing. Um, if you go to places like Korea or Japan, there are um, thousands of people all over the streets watching video on their cell phones, um, which means that we'd probably like it too over here in the UK or in Europe or the US. Um, but right now, of course, it's very hard for us to do that. And that's really for two reasons. One is that the networks are still being upgraded. So there is a technical challenge issue there. It costs a lot of money to roll out a full 3G network, um, and there are issues there. The other issue is that today the content is pretty heavily restricted. Most of us can only really watch video that our mobile provider has chosen or selected for us to watch. Sometimes that's fine. Um, here in England, we've been able to watch you know, things like highlights from sports tournaments and so on, which is great. Um, but what it means is that we can't watch all of the other videos that are out there, and that's quite a restrictive force. Um, if you think about what's really made video take off on the normal internet, it's the f it's it wasn't really the provider sites or the big professional sites. Instead, it was the user-generated sites where anybody could post anything and watch anything. Um, that's the sort of thing that really tends to capture people's imagination. And right now, that doesn't exist on, on mobile. 